it seems to suggest that, you know, there are some changes suggesting perhaps that we have moved beyond the Renaissance. So that's what this talk is kind of exploring. So kind of how was psychedelics um, inspired? This kind of um, in part was inspired because of the changing sort of landscape around psychedelic science. Um, with all the sort of increasing media attention around these substances, I think it's increasingly important that academics um, or people who want to be academics or just deeply involved with this field, that they're able to communicate uh, effectively to a wide range of audiences in an interesting and educational um, manner. So that kind of was a huge part of the inspiration for psychedelics that kind of stemmed from my experience as um, an educational director of Sci Atlanta, where I would just do a bunch of talks explaining the latest in psychedelic science. And I found that I learned more from doing those talks than I did from any of the classes that I took as an undergraduate. So I wanted students to be able to have that similar sort of a similar experience of putting together their ideas in a way where they're not only learning more about like research, but also how to present something in a way that is compelling and interesting. Um, and sort of the model where it's a collaborative process where there are peer mentors, if you will, talk creation coaches. A lot of that was inspired by my experience as a supplemental instructor, which sort of had a similar format um, with student leaders teaching um, people who are neuter to the program, how to teach and such. Um, and also three minute thesis pitch was a big part of kind of the formatting for, you know, explaining things in a simple manner. So that's kind of like the inspiration behind psychedelics, which some people might be curious about. So kind of backing up to what was the background of the Renaissance? Why, why is this a rebirth of psychedelic science, so to say? Um, you got to look at the cultural background and it can be easy to forget when there's all this sort of positive press um, about psychedelics. That this is what the stigma sort of we were fighting against for quite a long time. You know, in the 1970s, LSD, you know, there's a headline, the hidden evils of LSD causing chromosome damage. It's evil, it's out of control. Um, and there was pretty widespread use at this time, but actually in the 1990s, there was actually more use. And during this time, psychedelics were largely associated sort of with rave culture, with parties. People were seen as irresponsible for using psychedelics. It wasn't a topic of sort of serious research. It was kind of a joke, maybe not a menace as in the 70s um, and 60s, but certainly not something that somebody should spend their whole career trying to study in general. Um, so what is the Renaissance like? It's kind of as if all of a sudden there is this time capsule of all these ideas that were um, sort of created in the 50s and 60s finally being open, psychedelics were finally being explored therapeutically. And I would say that this box was opened sort of in 2006. I'll explain why in a moment. But th there was research going on in the 1990s and early 2000s, but that was mostly focused on understanding psychedelics as a um, psychotelic method, which is kind of a different thing than the sort of Renaissance um, research that we typically think about when we hear about psychedelics now. So why do I think that sort of the Renaissance, if we were to put a date on it, started in 2006? Um, so there was Hoffman's birthday symposium. Um, so during this symposium, Hoffman himself described the need sort of to see LSD studied again. And people like Robin Carr Harris and Ben Susser were here and they met for the first time and started planning trials at this conference. And then there was also in the US, <laughs> The first um, study that Roland Griffiths did on psilocybin, this came out in 2006, exploring how psilocybin could occasion a mystical type experience. Peter Hendricks, um, my PhD advisor, he read this article um, in 2006, right when it came out, and was really excited about the potential of psychedelics. And he wanted to start a study right away, but he was told to wait. He was told it was too risky for somebody who had just finished graduate school to start doing this kind of work, that there was no funding available or political, or, and it was 
risky politically as well. So he waited, but you can see kind of that there is this flurry around 2006 where people are seriously reconsidering these substances. But at the time, it was a bit like these researchers were attempting to head into a dangerous jungle. The sort of stigma around psychedelics made them seem like they were a landscape of terrible unknowns of dangers. And just walking into this, this unknown beast, you were basically putting yourself right in harm's way. So to, to be involved with research in this time was very risky, or so it seemed. Um, and a lot of the work that sort of went on in this early sort of Renaissance era was very much inspired by that opening of a time capsule, so to say. So you see a very strong sort of influence of ideas um, and models of therapy that were very prominent in the 50s and 60s, such as psychoanalysis. Um, this probably stems from people being inspired by the work that had already been done. But it does give that psychedelic science initially a kind of frozen in the past feel. Um, so for example, Hoffman at his um, birthday symposium said, LSD was used very successfully for 10 years in psychoanalysis. And you can see how our understanding of how to work with these tools therapeutically was very heavily influenced by this early work. You can see at John Hopkins and Imperial, people being told um, you know, to lie down with eye shades, go inward, um, and there's supposed to be a male and female guide to imitate positive parenting, supposedly. All of this is kind of based on that earlier sort of framing. And I think it was a good place to start, but is this really an evidence sort of based practice or is it just that we're, you know, going off of what worked in the 50s and 60s? So there's a lot of that sort of in um, the psychedelic renaissance where it's just like this worked in the past. It's probably gonna work here. We gotta build um, our <laughs> ideas from somewhere. So why not the past? Um, and sort of to further illustrate what it was like to work in the field at this time, um, I asked Peter what it was like to start working on a um, psilocybin trial um, kind of before all the hype took off. And he said, it was absolutely a fringe area of science at best. And most of my colleagues thought I had lost my mind. At best, my colleagues were amused at my curious interest, whereas others didn't understand why I would pursue this line of work if no funding was available. So completely something other, something not scientific, something almost laughable, it seems. And there are a lot of sort of warnings in this early Renaissance era um, that because of the stigma and all of that, that if you want to go into this field, it, even though it sounds super cool and there's studies beginning to be done, you need to watch out. So this is, I think, kind of a, a um, well-known piece. So you want to be a psychedelic researcher posted on MAPS's website, but it's from 2010 and reading over it, it's really sort of shows how much the landscape has changed in recent years. So it starts off by saying, are you willing to accept the Except that your uncommon interests may lead to professional isolation or even ostracism. And are you aware that the total lack of government or corporate support for such endeavors means that you will never be rich and that you may, in fact, eventually land in jail and trumped up charges of one sort or another? If such considerations do not trouble you, then read on. And the article, as you can see from those three sentences, is definitely, you know, flashing warning signs saying, don't go into this field, or if you do, really, really, really think about it. It even calls researching psychedelics career suicide at one point, which, you know, in today's landscape, that just seems absurd. But this kind of shows um, the sort of fight against stigma, in a sense, that birthed the Renaissance, if you will. So, as you can see, with this sort of clear agenda to make psychedelics sort of science again, there was a really a big push to destigmatize de psychedelics enough for there to be further research. So you see sort of in the media, a lot of people, you know, standing around really scientifically in labs, um, even though they're doing human drug research. Um, you see books like the Psychedelic Renaissance coming out, but Ben Sussa, excellent book. 
Um, but very much, you know, we know a lot of things, you know, we've done a few studies and, you know, we're scientists, yes. Um, so it's really sort of a huge push to convince institutions and the general public that this research is real science and that it's worth pursuing and that the risks that were sort of created with um, sort of the fear that happened in response to the counterculture movement in the 60s was unwarranted, that we're serious at the time, that we got lab coats. <laughs> so yeah, that was kind of the inspiring motif, I would say, of the, the Renaissance. Um, so even though there have um, been a lot of interesting trials, it's often really shocking to think about how small of samples um, these trials are. So, you know, um, <clears throat> We think about how smoking cessation, 14 participants. There have been more people in depression trials and end of life anxiety trials. Um, these are all of psilocybin assisted therapy, but still, if, if you're familiar with any sort of drug development um, study that goes on in a different field or mindfulness research for various mental illnesses, um, you'll know that these trial sizes are really pilots. And a lot of them, these studies even say that they're pilots, but yet we sort of have this sense that, oh yes, we have found something that we know, we know how it works, or at least that's kind of how the media put it for quite a while. Um, so with psychedelic neuroimaging, we sort of see a similar thing where we have these very, very small samples. And yet you're seeing all these articles come out. So all the so here's one art um, study. So that's in, I don't think it's 12 people, but it's in like 15, 16 people. And you see all these publications coming out um, about it. And similarly, a lot of the other trials, even if they don't have a lot of publications, they're very small. They're still in, or in other fields, what people would consider a sort of pilot trial. And it's understandable why people would act like this. If, you know, LSD or whatever has not been studied <laughs> Um, in the brain with like a modern like fMRI, it's very exciting. And, you know, you might want to analyze it as much as possible, but we really just don't have these samples to be able to do it. It's still, or to the extent that, that it was analyzed. Um, so it's still just very much showing we're very much just in the beginning of understanding how psychedelics could work in the brain, despite all the publications. Um, so that kind of covers sort of the academic ap amplification of psychedelics, I would say. But there was also a huge push in the media to sort of make it mainstream. Uh, Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, obviously was the sort of the catalyst in a lot of ways for starting this huge media avalanche covering psychedelics, showing how healing that they could be for a wide range of conditions that, you know, normal people are using psychedelics that, you know, the goop lab or whatever, that this is a wellness sort of trend, that it's not people going out to parties, um, that we know a lot about how these things work. And, you know, it was good in a sense, it was good, but it was also a bit too much at times. Um, so you can see that, you know, it's not just people throwing out a bunch of media about psychedelics and nothing happening. There's a real uptick in use sort of, or interest amongst the general public. So if you go on, if you observe the number of LSD um, Reddit subscribers, it rapidly started going up around 2018. You might just say, oh, people are using Reddit more. Um, <clears throat> this really is an account showing a real trend, but you can look at the population data as well. So from 2015 to 2018, LSD use in the past year increased 56.4%. And this was mostly, or the one of the bigger increases in use was among college um, educated individuals. So this is showing that, you know, that they're reading Colin's book or they're, you know, watching those Netflix documentaries. So it's very sort of, um, mainstream cultured um, sort of outlets and thinking, oh yeah, so I, I could 
do this. Uh, it might be beneficial for me. It, it shows that not only did we sort of change the scientific landscape um, with getting it destigmatized in institutions, but also the societal one. And, you know, I mean, there, there were good fact, effects of this, I would say, but there, it's also an issue. It kind of reminds me in a sense of Jurassic Park almost. It's as if you have a safari into this jungle, as we talked about earlier, and, you know, there's a lot of cool things in that jungle, but you really haven't quite thought through how all of it's going to work, the details. But it's very exciting. Let's go, I'll go in. It can sometimes feel like that, <laughs> sometimes. So this kind of goes to the dangers of hype. Um, there's sort of a famous Greek myth, Icarus. Icarus um, and his father were in prison and they decided to make wings to fly out of the prison using wax and feathers. So they both start flying out, right? And it, it's working, it's going great. They're escaping, they're achieving their motive. And yet Icarus, he, he gets excited and he's like, ooh, I wanna see what I can do. And he starts flying close to the sun or as high as he can. And his father warns him against this, that he keeps doing it, keeps pushing it. And what happens? His feathers, well, the wax melt and he catapults to the ground. When you push a technology beyond what it's capable of doing safely, or, you know, you maybe just push yourself to, you push a technology to the limits before you really understand what it works, it can be dangerous. So there is a TED talk a while back called something along the lines of, is MDMA the antibiotic of psychiatry? And I think I actually put this talk as one of the examples for like a good talk in um, Psychedelics 2021. But there's also some sort of issues with describing um, antibiotics and MDMA as being similar. So you see, um, you know, penicillin in around like the World War II sort of era, it was seen as a miracle cure. It was very exciting. It was in mass production, you know, it was easy to get, widely accessible. And now where are we today with antibiotics? Antibiotics resistance is a huge problem that is estimated to kill more people um, by 2050 than cancer. And you can already see that it is more um, deadly than HIV or AIDS slash AIDS or malaria. So our kind of over excitement about the potential of antibiotics or widespread use without thinking of the implications of what could happen without really fully understanding what we're doing led to a lot of issues. And you know, those issues weren't immediately apparent, but they're becoming apparent. So we need to think carefully. So this is sort of maybe a case study, if you will, on the dangers. There was a man who, um, he had bipolar disorder. He was dealing with depressive episodes. He also had a opiate use disorder. And, you know, he read all this exciting material about microdosing um, so that it could, you know, decrease depression, that it was going to help him get off substances. You, you can find many such articles saying similar things. And he sort of took this into his own hands and decided that he was going to inject um, a psilocybin sort of mushroom tea. And what happened, he ended up um, having the mushrooms grow in his blood. And he ended up being in the hospital for 22 days, eight of which were in the intensive care unit. Now you could say, yes, this could have happened before the Renaissance, before always kind of, or people can be kind of stupid with drugs sometimes, but he was exposed to all of the hype and was excited by it. So this kind of shows when we're saying all these positive things, we need to be very clear about the importance of harm reduction because it's inevitable that with more attention, people are going to be more interested and using more and not always within these carefully controlled supervised settings or probably not most of the time. So we need to think about that. We need to think about getting harm reduction information out to more people and kind of putting that sort of in with 
our discussion of how these um, tools could work. And also, one thing I saw the other day was there is a, um, a CBD candle. So that, that's a very strange idea. CBD, so a drug in a candle, how is it supposed to help you? But yet CBD is supposed to be you know, healing. It's supposed to reduce anxiety, reduce inflammation, all these exciting things. Um, I can kind of see sort of this trend continuing to maybe a mushroom microdose candle in the future. Maybe by 2030, who knows? But, you know, kind of almost using these substances and the hype that has grown up around them as a marketing sort of strategy without really thinking, is this even a logical use of these tools? And sort of the um, hype has already been used for, for marketing purposes. So there's psychedelic water now. Unfortunately, if you look at it, it the ingredients, it doesn't contain anything sort of remotely close to a psychedelic. Um, so that's kind of showing how this name is, a, this um, psychedelic buzzword has almost been appropriated as a marketing strategy. And, you know, this is not anything really new. It's almost to be expected. There's yoga juice you can buy as well. So, but it's just showing how much we have changed, the landscape has changed from trying to ensure that you know, psychedelics can be studied scientifically, that there's not a bunch of stigma around them to, oh yeah, let's hop on the trend. So yeah, apparently the water went viral on TikTok. You can go on Instagram and see that mushrooms are the new avocado toast, apparently. So definitely not a lot of caution or, you know, just, careful consideration with these sorts of things. So quite a change. And then there are also sort of issues about people assuming that these substances are, you know, inherently going to lead people to change for the better as well. Um, there is a case of um, Nazis who were quite interested in LSD and other such things. So you know, I think that doesn't say anything necessarily bad about psychedelics, but it shows that as anything becomes more popular, it will intersect with broader society, creating a lot of unknowns. Um, and we need to just be aware of that. So at the same time, sort of as this hype is going on in the popular press or shortly after, um, you also can kind of see in academia, there being some results or studies that are coming out that aren't quite showing, you know, that psychedelics are this miracle sort of thing that maybe we made them out to be sometimes um, in the past. So there is the psilocybin versus an SSRI trial for depression where the primary outcome was not significantly for psilocybin assisted therapy was not significantly different um, than the SSRI. The other outcomes were different, importantly, but you know it shows that we do need to think more carefully about how much we are expecting these tools to be really, really radically different. Um, and also, Compass put out a trial where, despite there being a lot of benefits for a lot of people, there were also people who experienced side effects. There were people who increased who experienced a um, increase in suicidality or might've even been suicide attempts. So I would have to double check. But um, anyway, that maybe they were, I don't know exactly what happened there, but it's possible that they might've heard all the positive press around psychedelics and thought, oh, I'm gonna do this therapy and I'm never gonna feel sad again. I'm never gonna feel depressed again. And you know, when that doesn't quite happen, it can be very disheartening for people. Um, there is a cover story podcast, um, Power Trip, that kind of explored a lot of problems with the practices of some psychedelic therapists and other issues. Um, recently, there's a lot of dispute over a neuroimaging study that came out where people um, came quite sort of angry. It was pretty silly. Um, but this kind of shows, you know, we're not just seeing psychedelics as being this instant, not instant, but this really, really promising tool anymore. We're just 
being more cautious now. And it, it can seem like we're sinking into cynicism, um, but we also need to be aware that there are issues to think about. And at the same time, these headlines um, were, have all happened in the past month. So, you know, people are microdosing to unlock their creativity um, doing nail art, apparently, even though um, a study showed that, you know, microdosing is no different than a placebo. People are still convinced, um, sort of because of the narrative that has come out. You know, you can start a psychedelic company in five easy steps. Um, that was something I need now. That's quite exciting. <laughs> um, and, you know, there are companies now saying that you should microdose at work. Bosses want to feed psychedelics to their staff. Wow. All right. This is this is this is a lot. <laughs> so this all kind of, I guess, relates to the hype cycle of psychedelics. So this is the idea that oftentimes when any sort of technology or maybe even idea sort of enters culture and, or science or whatever, um, that there's a lot of, at the beginning, really inflated sort of expectations. Um, the sense that we know a lot, we're excited, we're ready to go, you know, we're thinking psychedelics will solve all the world's problems. One session will cure, fill in the blank for months. I mean, there are studies showing that, but it was repeated and repeated to the point where it was like, ah, yes, you know, just one, one time and fix. Um, you know, microdosing is magic. We, we have found the neural correlates of the ego, right? Right in this one spot, very exciting. <laughs> um, and, you know, this is kind of the hype cycle, I believe is built off the Dunn-Kruger sort of effect. So that's the idea that when you're just learning something, you kind of think you know more than you do. And you can see that this definitely sort of probably happened with psychedelics. And I would say for, you know, general society, um, a general audience that, it does still feel like psychedelics are in that hype cycle, but you know, maybe if you're closer to the research process, it might feel more like you're in this disillusionment dip where you know we're figuring out we don't quite know as much um, as we thought, and there are risks that were unanticipated, and it can feel at times almost like oh, we should just—I don't want to say give up, but it's a cynical place. But eventually, the idea with this hype cycle is that people will sort of begin chipping away at those questions that they initially started um, maybe the field with or whatever. And this will build to a steady increase in what we know that is sustainable. So hopefully we eventually get to that steady progress um, sort of part of the hype cycle. And it's important to say that the hype cycle is just a model there are many technologies and ideas that don't really follow this cycle. So who knows what will happen. But still, it seems clear to me that we have moved beyond the Renaissance into sort of the psychedelics era, if you will. And the X meaning the unknown of how psychedelics will intersect with broader society. Except that it's clear at this point that a lot of people and interests are all intersecting with this one tool. So maybe what can we say sort of the objectives maybe of the psychedelics era could be? Um, do the science, you know, people fought for psychedelics to be destigmatized and created this massive amount of hype in part so that there was institutional support, government support, to do the science, to do the research thoroughly and meticulously. And we really need to think about how we could integrate these substances into broader society and medicine carefully. Because it's clear that with the increasing media coverage, there does seem to be increasing use. So things like the Fireside Project, um, which is a text line for people who are having um, psychedelic experiences and want to integrate them or whatever, um, that exists. That's one example of sort of how this is happening. There, there's a lot more work to be done, quite a bit more. And we need to very carefully sort of consider what can go wrong with psychedelics and how to best mitigate those harms. Um, I think in the past, you know, one example could be psychedelics can 
call it psychosis. Um, there's not a lot of research really exploring how serious of a risk that is, to be honest. Um, and there are harms that we might be unaware of just because we haven't investigated um, what can go wrong carefully. And it's very important that we do this work because we need to solve or try to solve some of the issues before you know the cat's out of the bag and these tools are being used everywhere. Um, and I think it's very important too to get more diverse perspectives um, in both the academic arena and the cultural one as well. And focusing more on educating people and not evangelicalizing, um, which can happen, it seems. So one thing to think about when we think about the Renaissance is it wasn't really a global phenomenon, or it still isn't. So to my knowledge, these are the countries where psychedelic research is ongoing. Um, and you can see it's primarily, you know, the North America, some countries in South America, Europe, and Australia. There are huge swaths of the globe that don't have any psychedelic research going on. I would approximate that 11% of the world's population lives in a country with psychedelic research. You know, China and India, they're not, to my knowledge, doing any psychedelic research. If these tools are really useful, shouldn't they be able to get access to them as well? Shouldn't they be doing work? What, what is going on with that? I don't know, but and something to consider. Um, you kind of saw the issues with um, a medicine only being developed really in some countries with the COVID vaccine. So you can see how this can create huge disparities um, for people. Psychedelics are really useful. Might this create huge disparities in people's mental health between countries? And it's a really big problem because, you know, a lot of the countries with the worst mental health issues aren't necessarily going to be treated right away, or they're not doing the, the research to lay that groundwork. So you think about it, the countries, the highest suicide rate. None of those are doing psychedelic research to my knowledge. Um, countries with the highest rates of smoking, again, um, Chile might be. Um, none of those, or most of those countries are not doing psychedelic research. So it's really a, a huge problem um, that we need to think about as we, we see psychedelics supposedly going mainstream. And even in the US, think about this. Does everybody really know about psychedelic assisted therapy and will it be accessible to them? Will it be accessible to people in rural Appalachia, to you know, uh, poor black, primarily black neighborhoods in Birmingham, Alabama? You know, are these people even aware that Michael Pollan's book came out? I guess might be not. So, you know, even though we think everything has been all hyped up, has it really? We are all sort of in our bubbles. Um, it might be <laughs> worse for some of you than others. I know that working in psychedelic research, you know, it can seem like there's always all this media and stuff about it that, you know, it's on the forefront of everybody's attention, but yet even, you know, talking to people in the neuroimaging department, um, here at UAB who don't work with psychedelic research, they're like, oh, studies have been done doing that? Really? Uh, so we're all in bubbles and we need to keep that in mind. I kind of became really aware of how much sort of of a bubble I was in when I did a talk in Jasper, Alabama. So this is a rural part of Alabama that's you know probably about 45 minutes away from Birmingham. <clears throat> And it has an extremely high rate of substance use disorders and people overdosing. Um, basically, like you can see, it's a town where pills are the currency, supposedly. Um, and it's very poor, very unfortunate. And I did a talk at their Rotary Club. And their people had no idea what psilocybin was. They had not heard of how to change your mind. They had not heard of the research. And it was kind of like, oh, I, I'm going to recommend these books that, you know, have supposedly contributed to too much hype, but yet these people don't know anything about it. So that's, that's another thing to think about is that 
you know, we think this Renaissance has boomed or whatever, but it has it really, has it everywhere. Um, so that's one thing to think about. And the nice thing I think about this sort of psychedelics there is there have, there is more of a clear path forward. There are things like the Source Research Foundation that have um, grants for students interested in psychedelic science. If you had said that 10 years ago, people would have thought it was a joke, I bet. Um, there are psychedelic job boards. There are things like psychedelics and IPN, student organizations for psychedelics that are serious and academic. Th things have changed remarkably. Instead of having this huge jungle where there's no clear way forward, you can say, oh, there is kind of a path starting to be formed. And this is clear sort of on the funding level too. Recently, UAB, along with John Hopkins and New York Inter University, were awarded a $4 million grant to study psilocybin-assisted therapy for smoking cessation from the National Institute of Drug Abuse. So as Peter was talking about at the beginning of the psychedelic sort of renaissance, it was unimaginable that there would be government funding for psychedelics. And a lot of people were hesitant to get into this field in part because of that. But now the doors have sort of swung open and there is a potential. People are seeing that this is worth our time. Another thing sort of to think about is because in the beginning there were so few institutions with psychedelic research, um, only really a handful of labs. I'm sorry if I forgot anybody, but these places sort of became the leaders. It sort of became like a template for how we were going to do things, what's important to study, what we should look at. And it kind of created, I think, in a sense, a sort of lemming mentality. So that's the idea that, you know, one person's going to start doing this, one group, and we're all going to become very interested in it. And we're just going to dive right in and kind of go with that for a while. And this, I think, is counterproductive to good scientific sort of thinking. I think people need to be creative and, you know, be inspired from people other than those at a handful of labs, be inspired from work going on outside of psychedelic science that are more established, that are more, um, that have a greater sort of diversity of ideas. Um, so, I mean, even at UAB, there are times where I think we have been sort of lemming. So we just went along with the John Hopkins psilocybin therapy playlist for our cocaine, um, or psilocybin for cocaine dependence trials. So this playlist, if you've ever heard it, it's a lot of sort of yoga music, classical music, but we've had participants who listen to this playlist and they, they're on psilocybin and they're like, why am I listening to this white people music? What is going on? Like, I don't like it. It's making me like, ah. Um, so we need to think, you know, carefully about the populations we're treating, how we might address our um, studies for that. Um, and other relevant study designs, we don't need to just follow what's been done before. We need to carve out our own sort of paths forward. And, you know, the diversity of ideas is very important. You know, you see a coral reef and why is it beautiful? Why is it so ecologically interesting? It's because of that high diversity, all those different niches um, sort of being created. And, you know, the nice thing about having a lot of diversity is that if some sort of issue comes along and, you know, one type of coral or one sort of idea starts dying out, you still have all this other stuff going on, all this life. And if we put sort of our eggs in the baskets of one sort of way of doing things, then all our knowledge is lost when those ideas potentially turn out to be incorrect or not uh, ideal. So a, bit, a big inspiration for starting psychedelics initially was encouraging people to think creatively, to think boldly, to contribute to that diverse ecosystem of ideas. Um, so that we can all sort of flourish together. And I think this goes back to being willing to be skeptical of people, you know, doubting what's been done, not being sure it's the best way to do things. Um, and I think that's important because I think it inspires people to, to push the envelope forward, to, 
to learn more about what is going on, to create their own ideas. Um, I think that's very helpful for science. But I think having a cynical attitude, you know, thinking that people are, you know, just trying to get as much out there as possible to, you know, elevate them. Like, yeah, that could be true, but, and being cynical about that, um, it could be true, but does that help you do any more work? Does that inspire you to go out there and contribute to that diverse ecosystem of ideas? I think we should go forth um, in this air of unknowns with an attitude of skepticism instead of cynicism. Um, sort of another thing to think about that people have raised issues with as we become more aware of how psychedelic science will look to broader society is who are we considering the most influential people? Who are the leaders in the field? You know, who are the people that, that are charting out into that jungle of unknowns? Well, at least according to this list, um, it was mostly white guys, many of whom happened to like pretty lights, it seems. Um, but th these people all did a tremendous amount of work and many of the people on that list did but it's still something we need to think about going forward. And, you know, there is a push to correct for this, but by trying to correct for this, by creating lists of women who are, you know, doing work in psychedelic science, by creating special little psychedelic, women in psychedelic science seminars, are we saying that these people are doing work that doesn't deserve to be on that list? Why aren't, is why weren't they on that list in the first place, you know? And it's kind of silly because I can never imagine there being sort of, like it goes back to this t-shirt, right? Like when would you have a separate category for people just because of a characteristic about them? Why can't you judge their work as other people do um, or as the other sort of category? And obviously this goes beyond gender. It's there are so many issues with diversity in psychedelic science, but I think it's important that we ask, how do we get to the point where we don't need a separate list for people of diverse backgrounds? What, what is going on there? How do we change? And I'm not sure, and I would love to hear suggestions. So that's just something we need to think about. And I think sort of, we need to think carefully about how we describe psychedelics and basically maybe seeing them as wheels for the therapeutic process on this. So, you know, if you're on a bike, you could pedal somewhere faster than walking. You could get to a point of healing faster maybe than you could through normal therapy. You know, the computer um, by Apple is described as wheels for the mind. You can do work much faster, but you're still the one doing the work. This is sort of a different, sentiment, I think, than, you know, describing psychedelics as a microscope um, for the mind and saying that it's the telescope for astronomy. I think this is a bit different, saying maybe we can, I, I think it applies to understanding the mind and brain too, that maybe we can understand things that are going on a bit more quickly with psychedelics, but we can still obtain those understandings through um, other methods. So I think this really captures it well. And I think emphasizing this is very important going forward, in part for harm reduction purposes. You know, people still have to do that work and it's hard and it doesn't mean they're instantly going to be fixed. So I think that's a very important message. Um, it can often, you know, psychedelic science can feel like the space race with so much happening all at once um, you know, we got to get to the moon first. We got to do this study, brain imaging study first. Let's make sure we put our flag on the moon. But, you know, it doesn't really have to be like that. And that's not necessarily the most productive mentality. Focusing on, you know, just getting things done and not thinking about the quality and not, you know, maybe focusing more on collaboration. There are things like the Enigma project. Um, this is like a general sort of neuroscience project where there are 50 working groups of scientists exploring how the brain and genetics overlap in various mental conditions. And why is this such a helpful group? It's because 
there are people all around the world collaborating on this. There are people putting their minds together, coming up with standardized analysis pipelines and ways of doing things where we're able to understand much more than we ever could with just studies done at our own institution. Um, so I would love to see more of this in psychedelic science. I would love to see instead of seeing a study in 30 people um, with fMRI, seeing a study that ends up being 120 people because people are using the same sort of methodologies throughout and it's easy to combine our work together to further our understanding of how psychedelics can change your mind. So collaboration is key to the progress, um, I would, of psychedelic science, um, sort of in this era where we're dealing with all these unknowns and we really need to sort of gain a real understanding of what is going on with these tools very quickly as there is so much interest. So we're kind of expected to, but it's really, I think only going to happen if we can put sort of the best brains together. So we need to ask ourselves, in an ideal world, where are we trying to go? What would the psychedelic field, what would psychedelic medicine look like in 10 years? I always ask when I interview RAs for um, the lab here, what would your ideal study be? And we need to aim for that. We all need to. We need to work backwards from that ideal that we're working towards. So I think that would help us a lot to stand back and reflect a bit more on where we're aiming, where we're mapping, um, or where we're attempting to go into this unknown sort of universe. So I really think that now is the time to jump into psychedelics and make waves in the sort of anthropocene, if you will, of information surrounding these compounds where there is so much unknown um, and information sort of in terms of the media landscape can be sometimes overwhelming, but I think you can still start now and make a huge splash. Um, so I think that's very important. And I think we have it a lot easier than the people who started out this Renaissance did. We have things like psychedelics, we have things like ICANN, Source Research Foundation, all of this. You can say you're interested in psychedelics as an undergrad and people will probably not think you're crazy. <laughs> so this is, this is an amazing time to be involved. This is excellent. Um, so another thing I've kind of heard people say is, you know, talking to students in this field, um, and, and this applies to myself, is oftentimes it can feel like, oh my God, I'm gonna do something wrong. There, there aren't, you know, there's really not as much information about these things as you would expect um, once you get in, it seems. So we just need to go out and do the thing, whatever, whatever it is you want to start. You wanna start a survey study, you wanna write a paper, whatever it is, just do the thing. And you know, you might end up being incorrect. Um, so a good example of this was Humphrey Osmond. So many of him know him as the person who coined the term psychedelic, or yeah, psychedelics. Um, so he initially put forth this theory that um, through a metabolic defect that a psychedelic-like metabolite was building up in people's bloods causing schizophrenia. There's absolutely no support for this theory today, but yet he sort of paved the way for a more biological understanding of schizophrenia and psychosis. So he's thought of as kind of a pioneer in that sense. So just do the thing. It might not be perfectly right, but it's okay to be wrong. Um, it's good to be wrong, some people might even say, but just make progress, make waves. So, you know, psychedelic science in the 2010s, it often felt like we're going to dress up in this lab coat and be like, we know what we're doing. We've studied, you know, a few people and we understand how this works. And we didn't really know. And that's okay. We have made progress and we will continue to make progress going forward. I think this Steve Jobs quote really kind of, you know, puts what we need to do into words. Um, life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is that everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you, and you can change it, you can influence it, you can build your own things that people can use. We can all make waves.
And so we need to go forward and sort of map out this jungle that a few people were kind of scrambling around trying to map out. And we need to really thoroughly, you know, make those paths and build a bridge over the dangers. And so onward, we all go together. And yes, that is, that is the psychedelic there and welcome to it everybody. Thank you so much, Haley. So yeah, your, your passion and thoughtfulness and um, vision here was really inspiring. And thank you for making so many important points. Um, we have some time for a few questions, probably until about 1210. So um, if you would like to use your mic to ask a question, please raise your hand and I can unmute, unmute you or feel free to ask it in the chat. Um, and we have a question from Javier. So I'll allow you to talk. Hello. Um, so I was kind of wondering, so, uh, so obviously the standard um, for, you know, modern day science and medicine and everything is the scientific method. And, you know, being someone that wants to study medicine and psychology and psychiatry, neuroscience, et cetera, like I love the scientific method, but I, you're cutting out. Feel. I can't hear you. It kind of ignores the research that is done and it takes up that is more like. Hello? I think your mic cut out a little bit. Can you repeat the question about halfway through? Okay. Um, <laughs> no worries. So, uh, yeah, pretty much so. The scientific method, I love it, but I feel like it's incomplete in a way that we only accept that as the tr like as like evidence for the truth because we know that even the scientific method can be flawed. So I'm curious if, in order to you know expand diversity um, of research in psychedelics, like can, you, do you think it's possible to start including more like? Um, for example, like, like cultural experiences or like traditions and stuff like that, that people have been using for centuries or for a long period, like long periods of times. And they know it works a particular way. Maybe they don't know, like, you know, what receptors it opens or like, you know, what the biology behind it is, but they know like the outcomes. Um, like, do you, do you think that's kind of, that might be a way to start including more diversity into research? Absolutely. And I know that this talk sort of focused on a lot of the more clinical and neuroscientific research, but I think a huge thing that needs to go on is more work probing sort of how those people use psychedelics, because there's a tremendous amount we can learn. And not everything has to be, you know, the scientific method per se. I'm a big fan of qualitative research. I think there is so much that can be gleaned from asking people about their experiences, from understanding more from the first person perspective. And I feel like a lot of that really in depth understanding has been missing from psychedelic research. And I think understanding how other cultures use psychedelics, you know, from maybe a more ethnographic sort of lens, I think that's very important. And I think that can inform what we're doing in science as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. Amazing talk, by the way. Loved it. Thank you, Javier. And we have lots of questions. I think Victor asked in the chat during your talk, so I'll allow Victor to speak first, and then we'll go through. Hi. So yeah, great talk. Um, my question is kind of similar to Javier's. Uh, do you think that the Go, like the uplifting of, of this double like double blind clinical trial uh, as the best way to see how like psychedelics would be effective treatment for some sort of condition is one of the, those things that is going to have to shift away from uh, like we're gonna have to shift away from that being like the most acceptable way of doing psychedelic research or like the assumed like best way to conduct it like opiate use disorder for example um, <laughs> Philadelphia has a big issue with that as well you know, doing one-on-one uh, -on -one patient therapy, like even if the clinical results are positive for that, that doesn't really translate to 
a real world application where maybe we just want to have safe injection sites, which have some sort of like psilocybin uh, tripping room with like supervision and that, you know, maybe that is how the, the, the study is done rather than these double blinded clinical settings that are so expensive also to like do these studies. So I think that the focus on the double blind trial is because it seems to a lot of people outside of psychedelic science, like the most rigorous sort of tool that we can imagine, the gold standard after all some people will call it. Um, but there are a lot of times in science where we have learned things without a clinical trial. Um, so there was no clinical trial exploring if smoking caused lung cancer, for instance. There are issues, there are times where a clinical trial isn't necessarily a, a trouble double-blind clinical trial um, isn't necessarily the best tool for the question. And I think that might be the case very well with psychedelics. And I think that studying naturalistic use a lot more, you know, with neuroimaging uh, methods is kind of what I'm focused on with that, can sort of afford a way to glean a lot more information more quickly about how these tools might work in a real world setting. And, you know, if set and setting are very important, then it could be completely different out in the real world, the sort of effects that we're seeing. Um, and there are like the Native American church, um, for instance, they do mescaline ceremonies and they don't screen people as sort of carefully as clinical trials do for things like bipolar disorder. Um, so there's a lot we can learn from how, you know, people are using these substances. And I think that can inform our clinical trials going forward. Awesome. Cool, thank you. Yeah, and it, I know there's a lot of efforts out there to try to gather data from naturalistic use and kind of underground clinical use as well. I think the psychedelic data project, if you look that up online, is one um, that's beginning to do that. But it's, yeah, very important work. Um, okay, we have a question from, I'm not sure who went first, but I think Craig. So I'm going to allow you to talk. Hi, Haley. That was a really interesting and thorough talk. Um, I was interested in your sort of overview of the media stuff. I thought it was like really interesting. Have you read a book called Acid Hype by Stephen Sif? I guess it's my... I'm sorry. Have you read a, sorry. Have you read a book called Acid Hype by Stephen Sif before? No, I have not. I was going to inform... I was going to say, I was going to inform my next question, which is because like, it's interesting that what you presented kind of maps on quite neatly into what happened in the 60s. There was a lot of like, you know, really like positive kind of, oh, you know, it's great. You know, Life magazine would publish all these like articles about how amazing LSD was. Cary Grant talked about as this wonder drug. But obviously what happened at the end of the 60s wasn't that kind of stabilization that you presented. Something very different happened. And I wondered if you'd thought about that at all, I guess, as an alternative angle. Could we see the same trajectory where we get these kind of, you know, celebrities and whoever going on about how great psychedelics are, that it actually ends up in a really heavy backlash? Mm -hmm. I could definitely see that happening. And I think, in a sense, the hype cycle might be optimistic. It's mm. a trajectory technology sometimes take, but not always. And I think sort of what happened maybe towards the end of the 60s, uh, I'm not that well read on it, um, is that people began to sort of focus on, you know, what psychedelics could do for them and their career. You know, people like Timothy Leary um, sort of, you know, becoming gurus in a sense. Um, and I think that when there's a lot of uncertainty, it's e easy for people to kind of become sort of self-focused almost. And when that happens, I think it can lead to a lot of issues. And I think it could happen. And I think we need to be careful and have things, you know, kind of like psychedelics and where a culture of sort of collaboration and, you know, being careful about how we speak about these tools is really sort of taught to people. So. It could happen again. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to say it's one of the curious uh, kind of paradoxes of psychedelics. They can shatter the ego, but they can also create huge egos. And I guess we've got to be aware of another, I'm not, I'm not like taking aim at Leary, but since he used his name, another kind of character like that, I guess, could emerge and how that might affect the culture. 
Thanks, anyway. Thank you, Craig. All right, Clifford. Okay, uh, hello. Um, hi, nice talk, Haley. Um, I do have this question. Are there areas in the psychedelic research community that you feel represent a void that for some reason, nobody wants to discuss, nobody wants to study, nobody wants to explore? Are there things that you have thought about and you know that there are areas that nobody wants to touch because they're taboo or because you know people, and this is within the psychedelic community, not out of it, um, because they'll be ostracized and isolated. But if they take these areas of exploration or attempt to bring them into the research community. I don't know if anybody would be ostracized per se, um, but I know like there are a lot of areas where people will say things and they don't really have a lot of evidence to back it up. Um, so a lot of my research focuses on understanding how psychedelic and psychotic like um, experiences are similar and how they're different, um, as well as sort of the risk for producing psychosis potentially. Um, and I think there, that area has definitely been understudied. Um, and an interesting thing to think about is there are people with family histories out there um, of psychosis using psychedelics. There are people who have schizophrenia using psychedelics. And, you know, we're not really capturing what those people's experiences are like. We're just going sort of off um, assumptions of what happened in the 1960s. Um, there are things people will mention, like, you know, psychedelics um, giving people a big ego, if you will, or increasing narcissism that really hasn't been studied yet. I've heard it several times. So there are definitely things out there and, you know, I'm trying to figure out what those are and mm -hmm. going forth and, you know, putting some evidence out so people can explore further. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. We have a couple more questions, David. Muted. I am now unmuted. Yes. Yep. Hello, all. Thanks so much, Haley. Um, I guess now I can riff on what all three of the previous presenters brought up. So I can say I was part of a recent NIH mastermind meeting involving the creation of a center for psychedelic studies, at the institution I'm at, and it was a community-based participatory research session with community partners who were ethnographically informing our coming research design. That's from the NIH. So I can give some reprise there um, and say that this is at least being thought of where I am. Um, on the hype train, Haley, like one thing I think of there is this disillusionment that you described. And I often think of one of the benefits of like ingesting psychedelic substances is the return from disillusionment and the reestablishing of a value system as that happens. And so maybe this is like, Sorry, it's like meta, but one way that the field itself will be using its own methods to kind of like be like, okay, we went there and now that everything got scattered about and like we're going to reestablish the values. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Clifford on the no-go zones. Um, this is like one area I'm really interested in. So at that NIH mastermind meeting, um, I met a woman who had overseen over 2000 psychedelic assisted sessions. And I asked her if she'd ever treated someone in a wheelchair. I work with people in wheelchairs. And she said one. And that really got me because that is not a representation of the, this was in America, the American population that has paralysis resulting in them being in a wheelchair. So I think this is really, really important to be thinking about these places we're not going that probably we should be. But yeah, thank you. Not a lot of questions, but. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. That's good to hear about the NIH. All right, um, Tara or Tara, I'm not sure. Yeah, am I unmuted? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, first, thank you guys for having this space for us all to come and connect. Um, one of the questions I have, or really a question for you guys, as people who are moving the ball along and really introducing and, and building a scientific validation for the use of psychedelic medicine for many types of disorders, especially psychosomatic disorders. How do you feel about the licensing or um, training of integration counselors and therapists? I'm sure you all have seen the 
wave of licensed shamans and people like that who are now coming out saying they know how to treat and help people in that integration period, but they don't really have a lot of knowledge in it. And I, for one, believe that integration is the most important part of the whole journey in itself. So people can reintegrate, as the previous person said, those value systems and be able to take what they have learned and do the work even well after the initial dose of medicine. So how do you feel about sharing the knowledge and training, even for current psychotherapists, sharing psychedelic knowledge and how to help people move through these issues? But how do you feel about that? So how do I feel about sort of the emergence of people claiming to be sort of integration coaches? Um, I guess the question and how that fits with, you know, people in psychedelic science sharing what they know? Yeah, so yes, exactly. How do you feel about, should anyone, should we just be able to allow anyone to jump in this space? Or do you believe that training or licensing is important as people begin to use these medicines, even outside the scientific setting? And do you believe that people should need licensing or training to be able to step into that space? So I think we have to ask what would happen if there were no integration coaches at all? Would we be sort of better off? Um, and I don't know that that's necessarily the answer. Um, and I think that, you know, sort of, you know, maybe a peer counseling approach could be helpful. There are programs like um, Zendo that will go to festivals and provide harm reduction for people having often difficult psychedelic experiences. And those people aren't necessarily licensed. Um, and they're sort of sharing often the insights that people um, in how to work with somebody on psychedelics that you would get um, from working on a clinical trial or something. So I think in general, it's probably better that there are people becoming interested in um, you know, helping people integrate the experience. But I think that there does need to be more education around how to best do that for people. And people need to be aware that you know, there might be people out there. There are people out there who are doing it you know, because it is a hyped up topic because they can make money doing it. Um, so people need to be cautious when selecting somebody, but I think it, it's probably better than if nothing existed. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you but for that. Still, I, I, I tend to agree with you in this space. Um, again, capitalism at its finest. Again, people realize they can make money in this space. And I love that Zendo has their training project and their other um, fireside chat, being able to allow people to help peer-to-peer -peer counseling that have either gone through their own experience or do have that training. Because as we all know, some people can have a very difficult experience that can create um, short-term psychosis. And to be able to have that training, I think is highly important. And there's not a lot of research really, or not any off the top of my head, kind of looking at how sort of something like Zendo is really helping people. So I, I really hope that there's sort of more empirical evidence about how to best sort of do this and what the outcomes are. So going forward, I think we need to do that. Thank you. Craig and Clifford, you have your hands up. I'm not sure if you have another question or if that's just remaining from last time. No worries. All right, so we don't have any other questions. Not sure about Clifford. We'll see. Okay, yeah, yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, I just have uh, one, one um, question, Taylor. So I was glad that you brought up um, the model of um, psychotherapy used that basically replicates the LSD format and is still being used today. Because I don't know about back then, but I know today that yeah. format could lead to abuse. You know, blindfolding people. And even if it's a male, female um, uh, team, uh, I think with, it's, if you're keeping your, um, if you're really paying attention, there's a lot of, allegations of abuse out there today. I mean, a lot. I mean, I was shocked when I found out the extent of it. 
Um, and I won't say the names of the organizations. We all know who they are. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot. And these organizations use these formats. I was just wondering what your thoughts were about that. So I think things like the blindfolding are done because that is kind of what became the sort of established way to do things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, have there been any, been any studies saying, okay, let's take the blindfold mm -hmm. off and mm -hmm. see what the, what, what effect on the therapeutic process does that have? Um, and I think, you know, for some people, it can be more uncomfortable than others putting on a blindfold. And it's something, you know, much like, and you know, the other sort of psychedelic therapy practices, we need to see, is this the best way to do this? We need to explore that now that we have, you know, sort of set that precedent of, oh, you can give psychedelics to people in a therapy setting. Now let's figure out how do we actually do that in the way that maximizes their potential. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Haley, for answering all these questions and thank you guys for asking so many good questions. Um, so, there, yeah. There's one small comment. Uh, Haley, could participants reach out to you with any questions that they have via email? Yes, I will put that in the chat. Twitter as well. Great. Yes, Haley has a good Twitter to follow. <laughs> Always post very intriguing questions and thought exercises. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I just want to say thank you again to Haley, um, both for, or for conceptualizing psychedelics at the beginning, and also for this talk that carried us through um, the psychedelic renaissance and illustrated what the field looks like now and how it will look going forward. So thank you so much for the time and for coming in. Um,